Cold Bath Street by A.J. Hartley. Prologue. Preston, Lancashire, England. 15th of September, 1978. 9.22 p.m. Preston Old Corn lay quite still, eyes shut, trying to shrug off the cold grip of the nightmare. He'd had it before, but this time had been different, worse. It hadn't been so bad at first. He had merely relived a part of his walk home from Scouts, trudging alone along the dark pavement with its high hawthorn hedges and its pale and overspaced street lamps. On Woodside Avenue, he'd paused to take in the way the light behind the tree made its clutter of bare branches spiral like a cobweb. He passed the top of Heather Grove, then turned toward Ribbleton Avenue in Greenlands. The dream replayed all of it, down to the last detail, even the part about his scout uniform. Preston hated the scouts. All that standing to attention, marching around and practicing not like they were soldiers. He especially hated the uniform, which had to be pristine. The red and white neckerchief rolled just perfect, so the leather woggle slipped up to his throat like a noose. Some of the boys were proud of it. The same boys, oddly, who despised their John South with school uniforms. But Preston felt stupid and embarrassed in it. This very night, just as he was leaving Woodside Avenue, he had passed a family standing outside a house with a for sale sign. There was a man leaning on the bonnet of an off-white, rust-spotted Vauxhall Cavalier. A woman with a furrowed brow and a girl close to his own age, maybe 14, with chestnut hair and bright, clever eyes. Her parents looked weary and dissatisfied, and Preston caught the woman saying something about the kitchen being too small. The girl just looked bored. Preston had tried to give her a sympathetic look as he passed, but she'd smirked and said, Nice uniform. Preston had wanted to roll his eyes and shake his head, make some quick, smart remark that said he knew how ridiculous he looked, but instead, he'd flushed and looked away saying nothing as usual it wasn't the uniform's fault of course he would have done the same which is to say he would have done nothing no matter what he'd been wearing but it still rankled he was nearly 15 for god's sake girls looked at him sometimes he could tell he just couldn't respond couldn't stop being a kid now if he had the leather jacket he'd been saving for the one his father flatly refused to let him buy, then maybe things would be different. Maybe he would be. The jacket would mean Preston was a rebel, not a punk exactly, despite the music he'd started listening to over the summer. Wouldn't mean he was a delinquent, just that he was his own person. He didn't see why his father couldn't see that. It was time his parents got out of his way, time they accepted that he wasn't a kid anymore. All that part of the dream had been real. The walk, the girl, the thoughts about his uniform and the leather jacket. It had all happened just like that, which was strange when he thought about it, because dreams weren't usually so realistic. They jumped around following their own surreal logic, leaping from place to place, turning people into other people, the mood rolling like the grey waves on Blackpool Beach. Not this one this one had been just the same as his walk home. Every ordinary and uninteresting detail, just the way it was every Friday night. Until he crossed the street. Then it had changed. Without warning, the flat, drab recreation had tumbled into nightmare. Preston had waited to cross over the road, staying as long as he could in the glare of the newsagents, passing cuffs which sold the best ice cream in town, the spinning wheel and the hardware shop that always smelled of paraffin, because the other side of the street was dark and shrouded with trees. 
But then he'd come to the cemetery railings, and the other side of Ribbleton Avenue had quickly become the lesser of two evils. So he crossed, heading for home down Stuart Road as the world slid toward dread and horror. There was an unusual darkness at the bottom of the street, down by the tree-shrouded cutting where the old railway line ran. Preston felt it like damp, like fog, a darkness deeper and more menacing than the heavy shade of the chestnut tree by the tracks. He'd glanced away, trying not to look, focusing on turning the corner into Langdale Road, thinking about what he would say to his father about the leather jacket. But then he saw it, and his thoughts derailed. It was nothing more than a grey shape at first, a pale shadow not quite as deep as the darkness which stood in the silent gardens and blank windows of the sleeping houses. But he felt its presence, and his heart quickened with his footsteps. Still, when he looked back again, it had halved the distance between them, and though Preston broke into a faltering run, it closed impossibly fast. The anger he'd tried to maintain over the jacket evaporated. He stared fixedly ahead of him and dashed for the street lamp at the top of Langdale Road. But now the shadowy figure was somehow in front of him, between Preston and home. His heart throbbed, and a bleak and breathless chill descended on him. It was her, the Bannister doll. He was sure, even though she was not quite as he had imagined her before. Her hair was long and wild, but her face seemed to flicker like there was something darker and stranger behind it. Her skin was pale, bluish, as if she'd been caught in a storm or drowned in deep, cold water. But it was the eyes that stopped him, for they were colder still. They were terrible, black, and full of a malice so hungry that for a moment Preston thought they were less like eyes and more like mouths. The ghost looked at him with those awful, ravenous eyes, and then it did something new, something Preston had never dreamed before. It stretched an insubstantial hand toward his chest. He looked down as he felt the cold pressure of the spectre's fingers easing through his breast pocket, and Preston caught one more strange and unfamiliar detail. She was barefoot. He wasn't sure what happened next. One moment her hand was no more than chill night air reaching into his body, and the next, it was real hard and cold and closing around his heart. There was a rush of sudden and unbearable pain and a lunging panic that opened his eyes and mouth as wide as they would go. Then everything had gone dark. How much time had passed since the nightmare had finished, he didn't know. Now Preston lay quite still, waiting for the memory of the dream to slip away, his eyes still closed, conscious of a confused unease that wasn't fading, that was actually getting stronger and more pronounced as he regained his waking senses. Something was wrong still. He remembered leaving scouts, he remembered the walk home, and however much he would prefer to forget it, he remembered the ghost nightmare. But there was a gap in his memory between the walk and the dream. He did not recall getting home, pushing through the back door into the kitchen or going to bed. He didn't remember seeing his parents or sullenly arguing about why he should be allowed to have the leather jacket. He tried to find these things in his head, but there was nothing no sign any of them had ever happened. There was only the walk and the ghost dream. With a dragging sense of horror, he forced himself to open his eyes. He should have seen the soft glow of his bedroom window and caught the silhouettes of the old model spitfires and hurricanes he had suspended from the ceiling years ago. But there was only a dark sky and a fringe of black leaves. He was outside. The pavement was cold and hard beneath him, 
gritty and damp under his fingers. He was in the street a block from home, the very place he had dreamed of. But it had been no dream. He had never reached his house, his parents, his bed. The attack had been real. And as Preston placed an unsteady hand on his chest, he realized that his heart, which should have been thumping with fear and panic, was quite still, was, in fact, not beating at all. At 14 years, 10 months, and 5 days old, Preston Oldcorn was dead.